Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Friday, December 17th, 2021. I am so happy to be here with Professor Judith G. Cohen. Judy, it's great to be with you. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope it's a pleasure <laughs> for me too. <laughs> Judy, to start, would you tell me please your title and institutional affiliation? I am the Kate Van Nuys Page Professor of Astronomy Emeritus. Can you tell me about being named Kate Van Nuys Page Professor? Well, I thought it took him a bit too long to do that, but it did finally do it. <laughs> Who is or was Page and what might be the connection to your work? I don't really know who was Paige because when I asked, they said that the person was deceased. How do you understand the honorific of having a named professorship at Caltech? Uh, I understand it as a symbol of achievement and of uh, doing something important. And that's how I understand it. Yeah. Judy, when did you go emeritus? What year was that? Oof. Well, I'm 75 right now, and I think it was about five years ago, maybe. What were the circumstances of going emeritus for you? What changed? Uh, you didn't have to teach anymore. That was the major issue. I didn't feel that I should teach anymore, that, that, that the field was basically running so fast that I was running behind kind of scene. And I thought it was better not to teach, especially not um, not uh, people who had already committed to astronomy. Without having the burdens of teaching and committee work and things like that, were there areas of the science and research that you were looking forward to becoming more deeply involved in? Well, I had this big project running um, with some people from Carnegie, and I was hoping that we could uh, devote our attention to that. They're, they're my age, my collaborators, two collaborators at Carnegie. Um, and it was moving along pretty well. I had a postdoc working on it, but then I got sick and things fell apart again. <laughs> Judy, just as a snapshot in time, what are you working on currently? Uh, what I'm working on currently is trying to finish this big project that I started about five years ago. And uh, we made a lot of progress, and then I got sick, and my postdoc took off for, um, she's at Vanderbilt now, and my um, colleagues in, at Santa Barbara Street are good people, but they, um, they're not as aggressively ambitious, you know? They were, they were not, <clears throat> they did, it did not bother them that this thing was dragging on more than I think it should have, and it bothered me, because I wanted it done. And uh, so the net result was that they didn't do a damn thing over the past year and a half at all. Um, and I want this thing finished. That's my goal. <laughs> and what, what is the project? It's a project involving the outer halo of the Milky Way as, uh, as defined by the, by the uh, R. Lyrae stars. And the advantage of our library stars, which has been known for years and years, is that they, if you know the period, it's a variable star, and if you know the period of the star, then you know the luminosity. And if you know the luminosity, uh, you can find the distance. And, and distances are hard to get. So, and so we, our goal was to make a sort of a map of the outer halo using the resources of both Keck and their big telescope in Chile, the Las Capanas telescope. Um, and, and we thought we could make a nice map of the halo, the outer halo, using these stars as tracers and learn something interesting. That was what we were trying to do. Judy, do you see this project as sort of a capstone of your career, a culmination, or is it just the thing that you happen to be working on at this stage in your career? Um, I've worked on a lot of different things, and so I, I see it more as this is what I'm working on now. And I don't like spending um, probably about 100 nights of telescope time on big telescopes and then leaving all these loose ends. It's not good. 
So, and now, um, you know, one of the collaborators, one of the two Carnegie collaborators, his wife, they're both Canadian, and his wife lives in uh, Vancouver, and he was sort of spending a lot of time here, and then he'd go to Vancouver for a while. But during the past two years, he, flying between California, between California and Vancouver was impossible. Um, so this whole pandemic has messed this up too. You know, I mean, it wasn't just an issue that we couldn't do it; it was that we he couldn't fly to the United States. Judy, even more recently, what are some of the big takeaways for you from the Astro 2020 Decadal Report, both in terms of what it means for astronomy and what it means specifically for Caltech? Well, I must say that I was somewhat surprised that there was so much space and effort and, um, and clear, strong feelings about the issue of women in astronomy. That is the first decadal report that I've ever seen that addresses that issue head on and really hard. And I've never seen anything until that, until that came out that was that strong and, and public. And strong in a good way, you mean? And in a good way, except I, I think they almost went too far. But I mean, you don't want to feel like you're compelling people to respect you. You hope people will respect you for what you do, and 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 that was almost compelling, you know? That's the way I looked at it. Um, but since it has never been, it's a problem, it's never been discussed in such a high-level forum before, um, and there were a lot of strong women on the committee, I guess that's how it came out. Judy, what did the report say? What, what, what were the takeaways in terms of the issue of women in astronomy? And what are some of the solutions that the report suggested? Oh, I, I can't tell you that, but but um, they suggest there, there there's a lot of issues that are tied to this. There's the issue of children and, and the support of the children. And, you know, Caltech now is great. They have a uh, that, that uh, nursery thing over there near, near the parking lot. And I know a lot of the women use it, but you wouldn't want to hear the shit that I heard <laughs> 30 years ago. That was really poor. <laughs> I mean, it's now, and and I can't tell you exactly who's pushing harder, but um, it's clear that the president is concerned about this issue. And it's clear that, that the shit that I went through, they don't have it all. <laughs> What about on the observation side? What are some of the takeaways on where astronomy might be headed as a result of the decadal's recommendations? Well, I thought the decadal recommendations were um, quite, first of all, there were the recommendations on the large telescopes, which uh, was no great surprise, but making, making that real hopefully will become easier now that they played such a prominent role and, and in, in particular in the parts of the report that people from the Senate and such might read. Um, and, and the fact that that was very strong and, and that apparently they have strong support from the people in Congress and in the Senate that they've spoken to. So I think that's very interesting. Do you think that the TMT is more likely to get built as a result of the decadal? I think that the, I don't know. I think that the TMT, well, I don't know about the TMT. I'm on the, I'm on the, uh, I can't even remember the name of the group. Um, but um, the TMT has been such a mess for such a while and it has spent so much money getting no place. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's not fair. They've done a lot of design. But, but they haven't built anything. And, and they haven't solved the problems with the Hawaiians. And, and those are big problems. I'll tell you a little story. A long, long time ago, probably 30, at least 30 years ago, my husband and I were sitting on a beach, not on the big island, on one of the other islands. And um, my husband is not white. And so uh, he's not black, but he's not white. 
and not and if you think about it, that's the description of the Hawaiians, right? Anyway, we're sitting there, and this Hawaiian guy comes up, and he starts talking to my husband in Hawaiian. <laughs> so that got straightened out, and then he he started talking in English, and he sat down, and we spent an hour talking to each other, and he was just livid about what was going on in, in on Mauna Kea, and and in particular on the TMT and on all these issues, he just felt it was clear that he, and it was clear that he felt that they had been totally bypassed and, 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 um, in, in the decision-making processes and, and that the decisions making was not reflective of the will of the Hawaiian people. And this was many years ago. So, uh, yeah, it's a, that's a really tough problem because I would go up to the summit. You know, now you don't never go to the summit. But in the early days, you had to go to the summit because there was no high-speed links and this and that and the other thing. And so I spent a lot of time on the summit. The summit it, of Mauna Kea, you mean? Yeah, yeah. And and they have a dormitory-like thing about at the mid-level where, they, where people sleep because it's too hard to sleep on, on the summit. And so the dormitory is not on the summit and they have a kitchen and a cook and the whole shebang and if you walked around and looked at the people uh, on the summit there were very few Hawaiians they were all in the, in the cooks in the middle level facility and the cleaners and the this and the that it was pathetic and and I understand the issue in that the schools in Hawaii are quite poor and can't really educate people in the in the way they've been doing so that they can get a job at Keck or or in any of the other observatories. These are really long standing issues that have been to some extent at least neglected by the um, by the owners, i.e. Caltech, you see, whatever. And and it's only when they <clears throat> started trying to get permission to build again that all of this surfaced. But it's been there for a long time. Judy, to what extent is TMT essentially paying for the sins, as it were, of previous generations in astronomy with Keck and other projects? I, and I think that's exactly what's going on. And um, I think that the TMT now is trying really hard to demonstrate that they can be a good partner for the Hawaiians. They've been um, helping pay for the big, big luau events and this and that. They've been, uh, you, the, the director of the TMT is now living in Hawaii. He's moved to Hawaii, I don't know, maybe six months ago, and he's going to stay there for a year or two. And he said he wants to, um, he wants to understand the Hawaiian point of view and see how how one can make progress. Are you optimistic? Do you think consent can be achieved, whatever that might look like? I I don't know enough about the distribution. I suspect that, as everyone says, there's a hard set of hardcore descent, which is actually quite small. And then there's a, a lot of people in the middle. And then there's a small number of people in favor. And I don't know how they're going to deal with this. Judy, what might you say about the fact that the decadal is agnostic about Hawaii or the Canary Islands as a site for the TMT? Well, I think they have to be because it might well come down to having to go to the Canary Islands, even though most of us think that evaluating all the evidence that Hawaii is a better site. Observationally, you mean? Observation, yeah. I wonder if you can explain in some technical detail why Hawaii is better than the Canary Islands. Well, it's slightly higher. Um, and I think the weather pattern over Hawaii is very predictable because it's all that ocean. But the Canary Islands are, are islands, but they're pretty close to the mainland. And so, and also you can get dust from the Sahara that is that what they call Sahara dust that just blows in across the, across the, I don't know, remember the name of the, of the 
waterway be between the mainland and, and the Canary Islands. And you can actually get what they call Sahara dust. <laughs> so I, I think Hawaii is a better site. It's higher and it's, um, it's, there, it's more built up in the sense that we already have a lot of, um, a lot invested there that can be used. But if we can't, um, so be it. But I know I, I have friends on the committee that you know, have to do this, deal with this. And if you want to talk to people who are in the know and you know actively involved, then you got to go up to the level of Ed Stone and company, and not me. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we know generally what's going on, but not not totally. Judy, do you see? I don't think it's hopeless. I think it just requires a su sustained effort and an agreement about what to do. You know, that N percent of the workforce is going to be Hawaiian. And, if, you know, we started a couple of years ago, we started a program where we, where uh, high school students from the Big Island would go to UC and other places and for the summer and, and try to get them interested in science and get them uh, to a point where they could go to graduate school in the U.S. if they wanted. Uh, not many wanted, but they're, they're in general not prepared. The schools are terrible. Judy, based on how the decadal report uses its, its wording, do you see TMT and GMT more as partners or more as competitors? Well, we should hope that we're partners in some sense, but undoubtedly, There'll be a little fraying of that. Um, I, I have worked with people from Carnegie for many years, and uh, I have no problem with that. But the GMT is a much bigger collaboration than it used to be the, in my dealing with, with my friends at Carnegie. So I don't know how it's going to work out. It's a, it's, a, it's a touchy issue because there's a lot of pride and history in there. Because the Europeans are already so far along in their large telescope program, which is essentially going to be a neighbor of the GMT in Chile, if GMT is viable, how important is it for the astronomy community not to just have two ELTs next to each other in the Southern Hemisphere and possibly no ELT in the Northern Hemisphere? How important is it to avoid that situation? Well, you don't want to have no e e ELT in the north. Um, that would be very bad because, if, after all, the north is much better um, studied, you might say. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's some good astronomers in Chile at the University of, of uh, it's, not, it's not Santiago. It's, uh, it's a different place, but there are some good people, but not very many. And they all pass through. Many of them come up to California every year, so get in the swing of things. But um, I really can't see the point of having the telescope at a second, this, the successor to T TMT to be, and that's the wrong, it's, this is successor to our current big telescope being right next to the ELT. That's not very productive. That that will breed competition. If the TMT does not go through, what does that mean for Caltech and its long history of leadership in ground-based astronomy? Well, it, it's going to be hard. I mean, there are certain things that we do very well, and um, we have some really great people in certain areas, but you're not going to attract that quality of people unless they can be on the front line. And I think that will be a larger, it could be significant. Judy, for your own research, to move away from the politics and the budget and all of that, if the TMT is built, what will that mean in terms of some of the biggest questions in the fields of research that are most important to you? Um, if the TMT is built, then we can nail down the whole local universe in a way which we just simply couldn't do before. But of course, 
saying that the TMT is built is not quite enough. You have to have the funds that the decadal survey points to as supporting astronomy from the from the Congress um, to maintain an active staff and maintain the astronomy departments at, the be- at least the best universities. Otherwise, what's the point of having a TMT? And, uh, you know, in the past, I don't think that the Congress was quite so enthusiastic. And maybe because it, the financial situation was much worse 10 years ago at the level of the government. But um, it seems like now, from what I keep hearing and what, what was written in the decadal survey, they are interested. And they are viewing it maybe not so much as a competition with the Europeans, but certainly as an important thing. And maybe also a competition with the Europeans. Judy, I'd like to ask you some questions about terminology. So let's start at perhaps the most basic level. Are you an astronomer? Is that the best identifier for you? Yeah, I think it's fine. And from there, what role does theory play in your work? Um, in my work, uh, it, it, over the last 10 years or so, it doesn't pay, play a very big role. But that's because I'm an antique person now. You know? <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, there's a lot of computer modeling, but that's not theory. That's that's computer modeling. Theory, we have, uh, I would say, three or four people that are theoreticians at Caltech. And none of them have been to a telescope for more than a show. <laughs> theory is great it's really important but that's not a place where we excel although we do have some good people but as a self-identified antique i wonder if you can bring a little historical perspective to the way these terms are used currently and how they've been used over the course of your career so there's astronomy there's cosmology and there's astrophysics Mm -hmm. where's the overlap where's the distinction well, astronomy is, uh, at, at least in the, in the way I use it, it, there's something called observational astronomy, which involves getting data from the telescope, turning it into something that is measurable and can be modeled. I mean, there's, and, and if you can produce num- numerical quantitative results from the model, that's even better. Um, Then there's a whole bunch of people who are pure modelers in some sense and who may collaborate with people who observe but really have never done it. And uh, on our faculty, for example, there's uh, Sterl Finney, who's absolutely brilliant beyond belief. Um, But I don't think he's ever been to a telescope. (laughs) But his knowledge of physics and astronomy and how to put the pieces together is fabulous. And Phil Hopkins is in the same, I don't know if you know all these people, but Phil Hopkins is in the same class, although I think Sterling is more brilliant. I don't think Phil's ever been to the telescope, but he sort of does something between modeling and theory. Sterling is much pure, pure in his theoretical meaning. But to have a good department, you have to have all of these things because if you discover something interesting and you tell them about it, they'll walk off and work in a a parallel direction and produce some great insights. And hopefully, (laughs) so you need, you need both of these. They don't necessarily have to be in the same physical location, but they have to be friends. Judy is the, is the unique or even idiosyncratic way that Caltech organizes itself at the divisional and not the departmental level is being in the division of physics math, mathematics and astronomy and being in pma is that useful for you the way that caltech organizes itself yeah i think it's useful um i must say i i for example i never would have 
understood very clearly the the beautiful work that came out from Kip Thorne and Company, except that because we're we're close and we talk to each other and we we can go to their colloquy and they come to ours if they're interested, you can gain insight into something that isn't not up your alley, you might say. And and you may find something interesting in the junction. Judy, more specifically from observational astronomy, there's lots of different kinds of telescopes. What kinds of telescopes have been most important in your career? Um, big optical telescopes. <laughs> I was one of the people who helped build Keck. I worked on Keck and uh, for a long time. And uh, that was very bloody. It, it was not so bad for the first few years, but then, you know what happens? You always overrun on some project like that. And and the leaders in Caltech at that time were screaming that they couldn't go back to these people and try to get more money. And we, you know, had to economize. We were under tremendous financial pressure when at the end of the TMT project. At the end of the at the end, excuse me, at the end of the CAT project. It was it was a horrible situation. It was so bad <laughs> that um, I was the leader. I inherited from Bev Oak, who retired because he had heart problems, the leadership of the group that was building one of the three first light instruments. And we were we were so short of money that that we had we couldn't even at the end we couldn't even buy um, uh, computers. I'm not talking about big ones. I'm talking about you know this kind of computer. Well, that didn't exist, but something equivalent to that. And um, so at the time, we were installing this big thing that we had built, and we had we had to go up to the summit with, with a fairly two fairly a fairly large truck that I had rented at the Honolulu at the at the uh, at the airport there. I rented this truck, and it was about maybe seventy five or hundred dollars a day. And we got up there and we unloaded the truck and we were going to be there for five or six days putting everything together. And we were so damn short of money and they had refused to pay. Well, I'll tell you what they refused to pay in a minute. That I, um, I decided I would drive the truck back to the airport to get, to avoid paying the five days of the fee of the truck. And, and, and then I would try to hitchhike back. Now people don't hitchhike much in Hawaii. It's quite rare to see anybody hitchhike. But anyway, I thought I would try it, and otherwise, if I couldn't, if I couldn't get out hitchhiking, I would rent a car and you know, drive back up there. And I managed to get up there hitchhiking, no problems at all. I figured, you know, come on, it's an island. They're they're, they're nice people knocking out. Anyway, uh, here's an example of how tight we were. Uh, Bev Oak, who was the PI, and who had to retire due to heart problems. And I, I, we were doing the testing. And so there was a lot of data flowing around. And at that point in time, all of this, all of this huge storage capacity just didn't exist. You know, a big, a big computer had maybe 512, you don't remember that. So uh, I wanted to buy a computer for me. And Bev said he wanted a computer. I said, yeah, yeah. Well, well. And I call up um, the guy from Santa Cruz who, was in charge of investigating money matters. I had to call him up for two $500 toys, right? And this thing cost a hundred million, whatever the hell. And he told me, no, you can only have one. That was crazy. Yeah. That was the level of pressure that everyone was under trying to finish. Kevin. And, and then the son of a bitch, excuse me. <laughs> um, and then Keck opens to some extent. You know, we're starting the commissioning. There's actually some light going through and everything. And and they started to <clears throat> to um, ask people what they wanted to do on their first Keck night, what their first project was. And so I said something like, "I want to I want to take some images of uh, of galaxies and see what you can find. Deep images of galaxy clusters." And one of my colleagues got really angry and said, that's my project. 
you know, and then that all hell broke loose. <laughs> it, it, you know, I mean, everybody knew that the first images were going to be really, um, if it worked, were going to be really interesting. And they shoved us aside. They really tried to shove us aside. After spending five years working in the lab and leading this team and running myself ragged and I've got a heart attack, you know. I was younger, I didn't get that, thank God. But that's how he, he had to retire, you know. That was horrible. And it and it was because there was no slack anyplace, you know. And and the institute was not it was private money and and when you spent all the private money, what do you do? <laughs> you can't ask for more. No, I don't. Well, we couldn't ask for more, and they decided not to ask for more for whatever reasons. <laughs> but probably the reason I was, you know, um, you're supposed to be able to estimate things appropriately. I don't know. Anyway, building CAC was a very interesting experience, but it was hell. Judy, some terminology questions of increasing specificity. So let's start first with near field cosmology. What does that mean, near field cosmology? In my book, near field cosmology means that you can actually see the objects that you're interested in and, and maybe you can get spectra and, and you can actually um, look at them and they're not so far away that they have to be um, five million supernovae to see what's going on. That's near field cosmology. So how near, what's the dividing line? How near is near field? I don't know, maybe uh, 100 megaparsec or something like that. And what would be the antonym? Far field cosmology? <laughs> well, far field is really, you don't really use it. <laughs> yeah. And what, where are we looking for near-field cosmology? Is it the Milky Way? Is it our... Oh, no, 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 no. no. Near-field cosmology is sort of beyond Andromeda, but not too far beyond Andromeda. And there's plenty, there's, the trouble with that version of near-field cosmology is that there's only two big galaxies, the, the Milky Way and Andromeda, and then you have to go out a fair, fair distance to get to the next really bright ones. So. And what what telescopes would you need to go to to go beyond Andromeda? Well, it depends on what you want to know. Um, you know, if all you care about is what's how bright the object is, you can you can go pretty far out. But if you want to see the spectra and the individual lines and stuff like that, you can't go too much past Andromeda, even with Keck. And then next, the chemical evolution of galaxies. What does that mean, how, how galaxies evolve chemically? What that means is that you imagine that a galaxy collapses from, from a bunch of gas, and the bunch of gas has the composition of the universe outside galaxies. And um, as it collapses, it, uh, you start producing elements beyond hydrogen and helium and um and you uh want to measure those hydrogen and helium is nice but it's not very informative <laughs> it's also hard to observe helium there's not a lot of lines <laughs> very hard to observe helium, at least within the optimum range i mean astronomy has broadened out a lot since you know since i started there's Tremendous gains in the infrared, tremendous gains beyond the, the normal infrared. The only part that's left unexplored is, I think, is the is the ultraviolet. And that's when sometime in the next 10 years, somebody will put a big space telescope up that has UV sensitivity. Maybe. What's been preventing us from understanding the UV? because it's absorbed in the Earth's atmosphere. So that you have to get above the atmosphere to see anything. Whereas optical astronomy goes right through, infrared astronomy goes right through until certain wavelengths, and then it gets bad. 
So it's the window that we could see from the ground easily. Because you're not going to, uh, I mean, kudos to JWST, but, but putting something much bigger than that in space uh, is hard. <laughs> and it costs a lot of money. Next up are galactic globular clusters. What are they? All right. Uh, well, galactic means that they're found in our galaxy. Well, they're found in all, all galaxies, as far as we know. But but the ones that are nearby and brighter are the ones you can study the easiest. And globular clusters are basically um, self-gravitating aggregations of stars that... Uh, that move around each other as if, and if, that are a single, belong to a single entity, you might say. They're individual clumps of stars bound to the, the central galaxy. And and that's interesting because you know, you know what where they are, and you can compare cluster A to cluster B to cluster C in a specific galaxy. And then go and look at another galaxy and see if you get the same trends out. And you should. You probably you do, actually. How has our understanding of galactic globular clusters changed during your career? Well, it's gotten much more detailed. <laughs> I mean, um, when basically, you couldn't do any of that stuff until Keck. And that was part of the fighting around who would get what pieces of the sky to look at. Um, but... Uh, with with that larger telescope, you can study globular clusters out out to fairly large distances around many galaxies in the local group. At least you can you can do anything you might want to do to first order. After that, it gets harder. Judy, what about supernovae? What what has been some of your work on supernovae? I don't think I've ever worked on supernovae. I've uh, taken some spectra for people that, you know, if, I, if I'm on the telescope, you know, and, the, and now we have formal mechanisms for, for handling situations like supernovae where you don't know where, you don't know when nor where, but it does happen. And when it does happen, how do you arrange to be able to interrupt someone? Because that's what you're going to have to do. I mean, the night's going to belong to somebody, and you're going to have to convince them that getting a spectrum of the supernova is important enough that they stop doing what they're doing and look at your supernova. And and that kind of policy has took a long time to work out, but now it works pretty well. You know, there's paybacks and there's ways around it and stuff. But of course, the more you subdivide the time, the harder it is to make a scheme like that work. Judy, how does extrapolation work in your research? In other words, taking data from things that you can work with pretty easily and extrapolating that to understand bigger questions about how the universe works. Well, I would say that I I sort of have kept pretty close to home. I mean, I've never gone much beyond Andromeda. Uh, That's not true, but most of my work, I I really haven't gone much beyond Andromeda. I've done... um, some things right when Keck came up, which were clearly uh, some of the great treasures, okay, was the ability to jump beyond this Andromeda. And, uh, but in my personal work, as a student for my collaborative work with lots of other people, I don't know much beyond that. And for you, in terms of the observation, is it all about stars? Are you interested in exoplanets, comets, meteors, things like that? I'm interested, but I'm a spectator. <laughs> I think the exoplanet game is extremely interesting. And and I'm not quite sure who's pushing whom, but the technology for accomplishing it has become much better over the past five years than in the past. And I, And I think that's a reflection of the of the much better infrared detectors, uh, the much better control of pointing, all this stuff about active optics. It's it's a very tough technical field, but it's fabulously interesting. Judy, then what are the big questions that have always been with you in your research? What are the things that you always come back to 
that you've asked about galaxies, about the universe, about stars? Well, I would say that I've always wondered. I've, I've, I've done a lot of work on globular clusters. And, and that was because um, with Keck, you could pick them apart and get good information on the individual stars in some of them, and most of them, actually. At, at least if you stayed within the galaxy. If you wanted to do globular clusters in Andromeda, you could get an integrated light for the cluster, but not individual stars. But uh, I, I worked a lot on chemis the chemistry of all of this. But that was leaning on other people for guidance and help. In your education, how important was a chemistry background? Or did you get all of that in astronomy and physics courses? I didn't have a chemical background. Um, I had, well, I had a little bit, but very minimal when I got into this. But um, I was, it, it was an area where nobody, at least when I first came to Caltech, nobody else was working on it. And Jesse Greenstein, who was, you know, the founder of astronomy at Caltech, he was immensely interested in that. And he was retiring and old and all that. And, and there was a hole. I jumped into the hole. And... And of course, with Keck, the whole field opened up. But until, you know, I was I was working for 20, 30 years before Keck became real. No, more than that, actually. But um, and, and I was sort of Jesse's heir, his scientific heir. Judy, to switch gears entirely, let's go back to hallowed ground. Let's go to Brooklyn. <laughs> we'll start with your parents. Tell me about them. My um, my father was an accountant. He had his own private practice. Um, he had a number of big client, big companies that were. Uh, well, we lived in Brooklyn, New York, and he had a number of big companies that, for some reason, rather needed his services. All I can tell you is he was an accountant, and he was. We were not poor, but we were not rich. Um, my mother was a nurse. She. Uh, worked as a nurse during World War II in Panama. And and then I guess uh, after that, my parents got married after the war. And um, she, I have three sisters, so it was a family of four girls. And so she didn't work for a long time. And then she started working part-time. And uh, towards the end of her working days, she was basically teaching nursing at Brooklyn College. Um, so. How many generations back does your family go in New York? One more than my parents. My grandparents uh, were not born, they were born in Russia and Poland. They came here before the war, before World War II. Yeah, but not by much, yeah. Judy, were you, what neighborhood did you grow up in? Blackbush. Where? Brooklyn. East 19th Street. Was your family Jewishly connected at all? Did you go to synagogue, have high holidays? My family was uh, conservative. They, um, I went to, they were more uh, secular Jews. I went to the Workman Circle. You know what that is, the Workman Circle? No. The Workman Circle was basically sort of like a union for Jews. But it was directed religiously rather than... Uh, but it also had things to do with, with <clears throat> employment and stuff like that. It doesn't exist anymore. But at that time, it was a pretty powerful organization. And they had a system of... Jewish schools. These were not Hebrew schools. These were Jewish schools uh, throughout throughout New York City and in other places, I guess. And um, I went I went to their public school, which was after the regular standard public school. And then I went to the high school, which they only had one high school. It was in Manhattan. And uh, so on Sundays, I would take the subway to Manhattan to go to that school. And um, so I had a fairly uh, 
they weren't religious, but they were sort of union, old, old union hands. <laughs> what was the education in addition to your regular academic public school education? Well, I learned to, uh, I didn't learn much Hebrew, but I learned a lot of Yiddish. We had uh, plays and shows and reading Isaac Basir and Singer and all that stuff. That was, that was uh, all the teachers at that time were concentration camp survivors. It, it was, I don't know, I don't know why I kept going because all of my sisters, we all went to the primary part of the workman circle school system, which, as I said, was after regular school, it was not on top of it. Not, it didn't cover that. Um, but I was the only one who went to the high school. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed reading the stories. And, yeah. Judy, were you always interested in science? Well, sort of, yeah. Yeah. You can't really see too many stars from Brooklyn, though, growing up. No, but <laughs> but we... This is a really crazy story. The, the, there was a group in, in that met in Manhattan called the Junior Astronomy Club. Joel Levine, who's a big wig in... Uh, in the AAS, um, was it, affiliated with that. And I would go to the meetings occasionally. The meetings were in Manhattan, but once, every, once in a while, they would have a tr an observing trip and people would bring their telescopes. And we would go to Woodlawn Cemetery because that was the nearest place that was dark. <laughs> that was all we could do from, from New York. <laughs> What high school did you go to during the day? Midwood. Was it a strong Midwood. program? Did you get a solid education there, would you say? Oh, yeah, I had a very good education there, yeah. I was a valedictorian of a class of probably 500 people or something. It was a big school. When you were thinking about college, what options were available to you, both in terms of being a New Yorker and as a woman? <laughs> Well, as a woman, it, nothing. I, I had never encountered any kind of discrimination until that point. Encountered it later, but not there. Um, and uh, I had to get a scholarship. My parents could not afford the, you know, they had four kids, and I, they certainly couldn't afford a, an elite school if they had to pay. But I got a, a national merit scholarship, I think it was, that paid my full tuition. Or between that and Radcliffe support, I'm not really sure. I, it was made feasible that I could go to Radcliffe. How did you understand Radcliffe relative to Harvard? Well, at that point in time, the classes were all together. You know, if it had been 20 years earlier, then what Radcliffe was, was the place where the Harvard professors would go in the afternoon and give their class again for the women. But... But that was over by then. The classes, not by long, but it was over. And the classes at Harvard were open to women who were students at Radcliffe. So and they got a diploma that was signed by the president of each of them. So you essentially got, even though the diploma says Radcliffe, it was a no, Harvard it, education. I think the diplomas were actually signed by both the president of Radcliffe and Harvard. In any case, yes, effectively, it was a Harvard education on a different social basis from the scene. Had you ever been, had you traveled widely? Had you ever left New York before going to college? I had never been east of Long Island, west of Buffalo, north of Buffalo, and south of New Jersey. <laughs> Except on my, no, yeah, that's right. I think that's right. What were your impressions when you first arrived in Cambridge? Did it feel like a, an elite place, a very different kind of place that you were used to? Yeah, I was pretty hoity-toity, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was your major? What did you want to study when you first arrived? Well, my first year I was poking around, but I went over to the um, math department. Well, I didn't even bother to go because, unfortunately, the first math class I took was extremely, um, extremely devoted to, to uh, formulae and and not it was it was too abstract 
was like abstract mathematics without anything underneath it. And it turned me off math. And then I went over to biology. I didn't like blood. That was the end of biology. And then I went um, at the, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. You know about that? Sure. Yeah, so I went over there, and I met this young guy, um, Steve Strong, who you may or may not have heard Sure, of. sure. Well, he was he was he had just joined the faculty or something, and he and his wife, Karen, um, and he said, oh, come work with me. Have fun. Come, we'll have fun. That's how it happened. Do you remember what he was working on? He was working on... It was the early beginning of abundances. And, uh, ah, I remember what he was doing. He was making the first model atmospheres of stars on a, on a computer. That's what he was doing. Now, being at the observatory, how did that influence what your major was as an undergraduate? Well, I, I was a, an astronomy major, as far as I remember. I mean, it was, it was not... A, I mean, I was taking classes. You know, I wasn't doing a lot of research. It was just part time, so it didn't matter. What about physics? How much physics did you have as an undergraduate? I had a fair amount. Yeah. Who were some of the professors that were mentors to you, or who you got close with? Well, I would say um, the one I was closest to was Steve Strong, um, who was not on the faculty. I don't believe. Um, he had a research title rather than a faculty title. Um, I met Cecilia Pena Poshkin, but she was too old, you know, at that time. It was like meeting your hero kind of scene. Uh, I, I was uh, not particularly adhering to any specific person. As a woman at Harvard and Radcliffe in astronomy, were you sort of exotic? Were there other women around? Well, in astronomy, there weren't very many women, but um, it was not a very big department either. So that didn't bother me. I, I, I never felt um, anything too disastrous uh, in terms of women. Um, at, at Harvard. I did have lots of issues later, but uh, at that time, for example, I, when I applied to graduate school, I applied to Princeton. And I got a letter back saying, we do not accept women in the Department of Astronomy at Princeton. <laughs> you didn't know that, otherwise you probably wouldn't have bothered applying, or you wanted to just to... No, I didn't know. I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't cross my mind. I mean, Steve was I was having such a good time with Steve. I couldn't. It didn't occur to me. <laughs> yeah, we actually wrote. I was a junior or something, and we wrote two papers. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> now, what did you do during the summers? Did you go back home? Did you stay on campus? Did you have fellowships? I went home most of the time. Yeah. On the social side. Uh, was it interesting stuff. to you to be at Cambridge during the, all of the protest movements? Well, I wasn't paying much attention to the protest movements. I was, I was, uh, let's put it this way. I never had a date until maybe my second year at Harvard. Uh, and so I was trying to get some social experience. And I, um, I met one or two guys that were interesting, but that didn't work out. And then I met another guy that um, I liked, but my parents were horrified because he wasn't Jewish. But we decided to get married. And then, um, and he was after he had applied to Caltech. He was in astronomy, and he had applied to Caltech, and he got in. And so the next year, I applied and said that I was going to marry X and. Uh, here I am. And I got it. And then the guy came back from California, uh, and my parents had already spoken to his parents and all this other crap. 
and they had a wedding and you know all invitations had been sent and the guy comes in and he says i'm not going to marry you i've met somebody else and that was uh, pretty poor <laughs> so i show up at caltech and they had arranged for me to work for i was going to work for jesse greenstone for the summer because our interests overlap and jesse said oh you should go to go to europe you'll recover from all this stuff you know <laughs> and i said jesse i can't afford to go to europe <laughs> Now, how far ahead was Caltech from Princeton in terms of admitting women graduate students? Not much. They had, um, they had at that time two or three in astronomy. Who, um, who were still there? You interacted with them? Yeah. One of them was uh, Vicky. Vicky, what's her last name? Uh, Vicky from Australia. And she was married to one of the other graduate students. And then there was Virginia Trimble, who was a graduate student there. And that's probably it. But that was more than <laughs> most places, I think. <laughs> and it was the astronomy department that you came to. Yeah, I came to the astronomy department. What did you think of Pasadena when you arrived? Well, I had never lived in any place except, um, except for uh, Harvard and in New York, and uh, that was a pretty big change. And, uh, yeah. Do you have a clear memory of when you first met Jesse? Yeah, yeah I remember telling him to go to Europe for the summer. He didn't. He didn't make me you know, as joke. He meant it. <laughs> Jesse was very kind to me. He, uh, I had dinner at his house maybe two or three times. You know. That's a big deal for someone in my position. Yeah. What were some of the exciting things happening in astronomy at Caltech at that point? Well, I don't know. Um, I honestly can't remember. What was the process of defining a, a research agenda, getting a graduate advisor? Well, Jesse was my advisor. Um, no, that's not true. Guido Munch was actually my advisor, technically. And Guido, I'm sure you've heard about Guido. Sure. <laughs> I mean, he was a real loop. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was hard to tell how much was bluster, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But he was a real smoothie. <laughs> I just shined all that stuff on. I figured, you know, I'm here. They're giving me an education. I don't care what the hell that happens. <laughs> But I, I had a tough time because there was, I was just so lonely. And um, and the men that I had affairs with, and there were several of them, they weren't at all sincere. And, uh, they, they, they weren't looking for a partner. They, they were looking to have fun. <laughs> and I was looking for a partner. That's the way it went. What was, what was Guido's research? What was he doing at that point? He, he was working on fabric probe, mostly at Mount Wilson. And, and that was part of my thesis, was a lot of work at Mount Wilson um, with this fabric probe interferometer. Tell me about working at Mount Wilson. What was it like? It was crazy. <laughs> um, they were very hierarchical. Uh, very formal in, in the, their equivalent of the monastery. Um, when you went to dinner, the, the head of the table was the two, was the hundred inch observer, and the next person down the line was the, you know, there was a space. That guy was always sat at the head of the table. It was crazy. And um, they, uh, I couldn't stay in the monastery. They had a special, they had built a little cabin for somebody who wanted to bring their family up or something. Somebody from the staff, part of the staff. And, and I had to stay in that cabin, which was quite a distance from the, from the dining area. And, um, you know, when I first went to the monastery on Mount Palomar, um, I had to sleep in the in the uh, 
snack? <laughs> As a single woman, this is what yeah. you had to do. As a woman, period, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty crazy. And then they, they progressed and they they had, the, that monastery had uh, two bedrooms sharing a bathroom in the middle. And so they finally got the bright idea that they would just not assign someone to the other bathroom. And they'd give me like a two bedroom suite and everybody was happy. It was nuts. <laughs> Judy, what was what was the process for for putting your thesis research together? What do you mean? What did you want to work on? What was your thesis? Oh, <laughs> my thesis was on. Um, I don't remember anymore. I remember uh, basically talking to Jesse a lot. Oh, now I remember more. And but my formal advisor was Guido Munch, and I used his instrument. Uh, which was a fabric pro to do some measurements, which today we could probably do in 20 minutes, but then took a long time. <laughs> um, and Gino was really crazy. What were some of the big questions at that point? How did you define your your thesis topic based on those bigger questions? Well, no, I defined my thesis topic by trying to do something interesting with this with this new instrument that Gino had built. Um, that's how I designed it. What was innovative about this instrument? What could it do that wasn't possible before? It was the multiplexing of the instrument. That, that you could get measurements of the spectrum, of different chunks of the spectrum simultaneously that you couldn't do any other way at that time. Which allows you to do what? To conclude what? what well, that allows you to measure abundances and, and lines in a finite length of time, if you have to measure them one by one, and then you know adjust A, B, C, D, D, and move the grading and do this and that, it takes forever. So so this was a pretty revolutionary instrument that he built, and, and I was just graduating, so I got to, to do this. It was fun. What were your conclusions? What were my conclusions? Um, it, it was it was a thesis on stellar abundances, as I remember, and uh, and it was uh, I can't remember the the most interesting conclusions actually. It was so long ago. Do you remember who was on your committee? Yeah, I remember it was Gail and um, and Jesse and two other people that I don't remember, and um, I remember. Um, they asked me a bunch of questions with one or two tricks in them, and I got I managed to make it through. I wasn't sure what I did. <laughs> Do you remember any of those questions? No, I could probably I might remember them tonight. If I do, I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Judy. After you defended, what opportunities were available to you? What did you want to do next? Well, what I wanted to do next was I wanted to live in Berkeley. <laughs> This was, you know, the middle of the 60s, 70s. It was, I had a cousin that lived in Berkeley. And I had been visiting Berkeley occasionally. It was a lot more exciting than Pasadena. A lot more fun for me than Pasadena. So I wanted to be in Berkeley. And there's a thing called the Miller Institute in Berkeley. And I managed to get a Miller Fellowship. So I went to Berkeley for three years. And I had a blast. It was, it was a really exciting time for Berkeley. Now, are all Miller Fellows in, in the astronomy program? No, no. It's 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 a wide, wide range of uh, uh, areas of study, but um, I managed to get one, that's all I can say. And, it, and, you know, even before I moved to Berkeley, <laughs> I was... Um, very, very upset with you know, Vietnam and all that kind of stuff. And I started going to um, meetings and marches. When I would go to Berkeley, I would be a political person, <laughs> which you couldn't be in Pasadena. <laughs> right. And I did some really crazy things in those days. I, uh, I thought to myself, you know, I should save the money and the driving to Berkeley is, it's waste of, for one person was a little crazy. So I'm going to try to hitchhike to Berkeley. 
And I said to myself, okay, if I can get a ride in an hour and, and it points me in the right direction, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. And I did it. I hitchhiked to Berkeley. <laughs> Safely. Safely. In those days, it was okay. Now, forget it. You know? But yeah, I had no problems at all. And I, had, and I got there and there was some big peace march going on. And so I joined that, and I ran into my aunt and uncle. <laughs> they were they were heavy into that. My parents were never into the, that thing, but they were. So I had a great time in Berkeley. I, I did a lot of work, but I also had wonderful trips all over, and you know, hiking trips in the Sierras, and it was wonderful. Did you work mostly solo, or were you in a group at Berkeley? No, I was solo. I was, I was working in the astronomy department, but I wasn't collaborating with it. And what was the work? What, what were you researching in those years? What was I doing in those years? God. Um, I was doing stellar abundances, I think. Um, yeah. As, an, as a continuation from your PhD? Yeah, yeah. That's what I was doing. What were some of the questions in stellar abundances? <sighs> well, how, how much you could could reproduce all this with the miserable knowledge that existed in, in those days of atomic spectrums, top and, and structure and line lists and stuff like that. So that's what I did. How long did you stay at Berkeley for? Three years. And then I got a job at a place called the Kitt Peak National Observatory in Tucson. And uh, I went there. As an assistant professor, is it? Does it have no, a... no, no. Uh, they well, they have uh, they have the equivalent of different titles, more or less. So I I went in at you know sort of the middle bottom range, I guess you could say, and um, I had a lot of trouble the first year or two because uh, I had started traveling to Chile, you know, but Tololo was opening up at that time. So I had started traveling to Chile, and I'd, I basically had a lot of trouble with men. I just, I don't know what it was, but, you know, all these years I was looking for, hey, I want, I want us in company. And I met this Chilean guy, and we hit it off. And we got married, and uh, and I had to get a visa, and it was all very complicated. And it was a big mess, and it was an even worse mess because he had to get a divorce, and there's no divorce in Chile. It was a huge mess. And I was trying to, I hated to speak it much English, hardly any English at that time. So I, I had to straighten all that out. And that was a complicated mess. And so my first year or so at uh, Cape Peak, I was... Uh, not as productive as I should have been or might have been or whatever. And they told me they were going to not renew my contract. And I said, okay. And so I started taking classes at the University of Arizona to become a civil engineer. And meanwhile, I finally fixed him up so he was legal. <laughs> and, uh, and also we finally um, got enough money uh, well, obviously he didn't have any money, but when we moved to Tucson, I didn't have much money either. And so I, and he wasn't white, he was brown. So I thought, and I had to buy a house before he came. So I thought it was going to be better for us if we lived in a not pure lily white neighborhood. And so I bought a house in the not so, what people in Tucson would say was a black neighborhood. It was cheap. We could afford it. And it was okay. It wasn't a big house, but it was okay. And uh, we were robbed about 15 times. And the last time the police, the police came several times. And, and the last time they came, they said, look, lady, they don't want you here. And this is not going to stop. And you have to move. This is the police in Tucson. So we moved. And I told the guy, the, the, the man who I had selling the house, the realtor. I said, I want you to sell this to a black person. I don't want you to sell it to a white person. I don't know if it did or not. But, and we bought a house in much nicer. 
But anyway, uh, so my husband, getting my husband settled and all of these problems fixed took a lot of energy. And that energy had to come someplace and it came out of Kit Peak. And so my first year at Kit Peak was, I would say, you know, not the greatest. And the second, not the greatest. And then everything was fixed up. And they already told me they were going to kick me out by then. And I started writing all those papers and doing all this stuff. And they said, well, Judy, you can have another year. <laughs> and after that, they said, oh, we can have another year. <laughs> that, and then, you stayed with the bachelor's program at, at the University of Arizona? Yeah. Well, I, that's, I was going to become a civil engineer because I figured I could live any place. And... Um, yeah, I stayed with it to finish because I was almost there, you know. And uh, meanwhile, my husband, was, you know, he never had a great job, but he's a very talented man. And uh, so he got jobs here and there. And um, and then, so I was writing all those papers, and we were all very happy. And, and then um, I got a phone call from Peter Goldreich. He said, why don't you apply for a job at Caltech? I said, okay. Uh, and I applied, and I came for a visit, and they offered me a job, and, and they said something, like, what do you want? And, and I was such a fucking idiot that I, I was so overwhelmed by this un- thing, which was so unimaginable to me, <laughs> given all the shit I'd been through, <laughs> that I didn't ask for anything, which was totally stupid. You know, I could, should, could have asked them for a $100,000 startup or this or that or whatever. I didn't ask for anything. That was really stupid. Judy, what, what was it that garnered Peter's attention? What were you doing that made him reach out to you? Well, I had written a whole series. I had basically taken... Steve Strom wrote uh, the first abundance analysis program for individual elements. And, and I had basically taken that program, which he wrote, and I may have fixed it up here and there, but basically he wrote it. And I used it to analyze a huge number of stars, and not huge, but a large number, and to discuss chemical evolution and all that kind of stuff. So that was really frontline work at the time. And today it's common. Then that's what I was doing. And um, you know, so I made a lot of mistakes. And because my parents, of course, didn't approve of marriage, um, I just wouldn't listen to any of their advice, which is not so hard either. <laughs> they never really, they accepted him, but they never went beyond acceptance, you might say. But he, he was a brilliant man. He had very little formal education. Um, and he was the top uh, fix-it at Tololo. Extremely handy. He made when when Keck started when the Keck project started. I, I had a book of um, sketches that we were looking at, and I took it home. And he looked at it, and then he asked if he could keep it for a while. And a month later, he made a model of Keck and wood, and I put it on my desk. And Ed Stone walked by and saw the model. He said, where did you get that? <laughs> I said, my husband made it for me. And he said, oh, I'll buy it. <laughs> and I said, well, he could make you another one. So he made it. He, he sold that one to Ed. And then he made me another one. <laughs> Judy, did you, did you come to Caltech with tenure? That was my other big mistake. I made a lot of mistakes. I didn't. I was a fool. I didn't ask for anything. I was so honored, you know. Somebody who had been thrown out of could be you know? I just felt so, so, I, I did a lot of stupid things in my career. And, and, and I often wish that there were some people who took more interest in me and said, look, this is, this is how you play the game. I didn't know how to play the game. And that's the result of it. I didn't get to, I didn't get tenure until until I'd been at Caltech for three or four years, and I spent a lot of time in instrumentation, and some people didn't value that as much as others. And um, 
But that's how I got into the cat cave. I I'd spent a lot of time on that kind of stuff. How different did your experience feel coming back to Caltech as faculty, not as a graduate student? Well, there were still tremendous problems on the women's side. There were, at that time, there were five women on the faculty, maybe. And, and I, 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 in my usual crazy fashion, uh, I st started a deal where we would all have lunch together once a month. And I actually persuaded the, the faculty office to pay for the lunches. <laughs> so for several years, we had lunch. And we worked our way up from four or five to uh, maybe 20, after which lunches stopped. But um, I uh, suspected the first five of us would, would meet, talk for a while, you know, once in a while, when there were only five. And um, one of them kept saying that she thought we were being underpaid compared to the men. And so I said, well, let's have a study. Let's ask Caltech to do a study. Let's ask for a raise. <laughs> so we did that collectively. And um, it was very hard. They said it's very hard to do a study because Caltech doesn't have fixed salary ranges. You know, and because we were so few people. But they did agree to do the study. And they agreed that Anila Sargent would be our representative because she was uh, more acceptable to them, I would say. Anyway, they did this study and they agreed that we had been significantly underpaid. Who and was on the committee? Was this the provost? Yeah, it was the provost. The provost and Anila, basically. And um, they agreed and they uh, raised all of us to exactly the same amount, which happened to be I think it was two hundred twenty thousand dollars a year, and I was getting like one fifty or so before that. I mean, they were guilty as hell. You know, they had already been sued once by this woman in in, in um, she was in English. Yeah, Jenny Rillabella. Yeah, and there was a woman before Jenny Joy who uh, uh, had sued Caltech also. I think who had been thrown out. So it, it was, you know, we felt like we were pushing the envelope sometimes. Did you interact with Glennis Farrar at all? No, I, I, I know who she is, I think. She's the woman from Mass, right? Yeah, I never met her. She was gone by that time. But it, it was uh, tough times. Judy, were they starting to talk about Keck by the time you joined Caltech? No, 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 no. no. That was in the future. When did that start? What were the earliest planning discussions for Keck? Well, it took 20 years to build, and it was finished in about 2000, 2010 or so. Uh, I would say that things start didn't start for at least 10 or 15 years after I arrived. What were you working on? What was your research by the time you joined the faculty at Caltech? Well, I spent, once, once Keck, became more real. I spent most of my time on instrumentation with uh, Bev Oak, who you may never have heard of. Um, you heard of him? No. Bev was on the faculty. Uh, he was the main instrument builder for the 200. He built many of the instruments with 200 inch. He worked with Jim Gunn a lot. And, um, and, and he and I started working on Keck instruments together. And then, unfortunately, he had bad heart problems and had to retire. And I was left holding the band. <laughs> um, that's the way it was. But I guess, if I, I guess that discussions for Keck, the early discussions, uh, started maybe five or six or seven years after. There was no discussion. There, that's not true, actually, because there was there were discussions at that time. So I take that back. And the reason I know is because um, uh, there were si simultaneous. It was like everybody was trying to figure out how to do this. And so there was a guy whose name escapes me at the moment who was on the faculty 
of the University of Arizona who uh, was trying to spin mirrors, spin cast mirrors. And then, and then there were, I remember going to meetings in, in Berkeley and um, Jerry Nelson was a good friend of mine. I'd known him for years. And uh, so I think there were discussions at the time that I arrived with between UC and Caltech, but there was there was no agreement yet. It took another at least a year after I arrived before there was a formal um, commitment to work together, and then another year maybe to get the money all arranged and everything. And in terms of your observation work, was it all based in Chile? A lot of it was, but not all of it. Um, mostly because Chile was relatively unexplored, you know. Um, I mean, they had, they'd had those small telescopes for a while, but they, they were getting up to an 80 inch or whatever it was that they finally ended up with. And it wasn't so small a telescope. It was okay. And the southern sky was... I mean, there's a University of Chile Department of Astronomy, and there's a Concepcion Department of Astronomy, but they were, they were hopeless, so it was open season. <laughs> what was some of the work you were doing on modeling stellar systems? Well, I was, I was interested in, in globular clusters and, and how much of a diversity there was in the range of metallicity within a given globular. And then as you looked over the whole galaxy, what the range was, the whole of our galaxy. And then towards the end, we started playing with M31, but didn't get real far. So. And when did infrared photometry really get started? Well, Gary Neugebauer started all that. And, um, That was, um, he started it at JPL actually, and did some work at Mount Wilson. And that was just getting going maybe when, when I came back, just getting going. And then, you know, Tom Sofer was involved and, and he, he was sort of Jerry's right hand, Gary's right hand man. And then after, Gary became too ill. He uh, took over. And how was this relevant for your research? Uh, well, the infrared was a new a new thing at that time, and so you could get a lot of good stuff. Um, but it wasn't tremendously important in what I was doing. It was fun to watch other people, but I wasn't uh, involved in the IR much. Judy, tell me about the project to design and build the low-resolution imaging spectrograph. That was that was Caltech's big instrument for Keck, and um, we had a good engineering team. Uh, Bev had built it up over the years, and how he got paid for it—I don't know—but he did. So we had a good engineering team, um, but it was a big project. And I think neither of us were really prepared for the complexities that you get into with such a big project. And as I said before, at the, towards the end, the financial pressure was terrible. And since this was the first light instrument, um, or, or a very important component, it wasn't actually the first one. The first one was some some infrared instruments that could take a picture to convince Mr. Keck that it was working. And then they took it off and brought it back to rest. <laughs> but the first real instrument on there was, was either, either, either ours or, I'm not sure if it was ours or, or, or Gary's. But anyway, um, I forgot the twist already. What was the question? I don't remember either. <laughs> yeah, those, those were interesting days. I remember Bev was very upset because his doctor wouldn't let him go to the cellar because he had heart problems. And and so he would go out to Hawaii, but he would wait. He would be in the in the what today is the observing room. You've probably seen it. Have you seen it? Yeah. yeah. 
Well, I had none of that stuff there. It had a, a an old <laughs> an old key pad, you know, and that was it. And, and he got so frustrated because <laughs> we'd be running around madly on the summit trying to make things work, and he, he couldn't follow what was going on. It was terrible. <laughs> and then eventually, it got it got so bad they just started pulling it. Judy was building the spectrograph your entree to the larger project of making Keck a reality, or had you already been involved in that? What do you mean by making Keck a reality? Building it, just having getting it done. Oh, uh, I guess I was always interested in having getting it done. Um, I, I don't know. I I took some engineering courses here and there, and I. Uh, felt that I could do it, you know, what can I say? Did you ever have any interactions with Mr. Keck? Uh, I was presented to him. I doubt if he ever remembers meeting me, but I have been presented to him. Um, so I would say that I really haven't had any interactions with him. I was too genuine. <laughs> At what point, given the difficulties, did you realize that the project was viable, that Keck would be built? Well, we all understood that we had to build it because the man had given the money and 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 that Caltech, they would scrounge the rest however the hell they could, but unless it got totally out of hand, they were going to do it. And that was the attitude. How did you get involved leading the Caltech Faint Galaxy Redshift Survey? That was my prize for... Um, for all the shit work that I did to try to make the thing real. <laughs> and I had some, I had been, you know, I was friends with Roger Blanford and he had this brilliant student and um, David Hogg, who's now at NYU. And, uh, and so while I personally didn't have much training in that kind of thing, it, it was interesting to be involved. And, uh, I can remember X, and I'll be kind and not say who X was, at a, at a faculty discussion. And he said, that's my field. I want that. And um, and Bab or somebody else, and I can't remember, Bab or Gary or whom, beat him up privately and said, Judy gets what she wants because she's put all her time into this, and you haven't. That part was nice. I liked that's that. good. <laughs> How was this a game changer for astronomy, just in terms of what could be observed now? Oh, between Keck and before? With the survey, the Redshift survey. Oh, yeah. Well, this was, we could now do for a large number of relatively nearby galaxies what people could do before for the Milky Way. It was fabulous. We were, in the past, we had numbers, real numbers, for one galaxy. Everything else was very flaky. And suddenly you have real numbers for, let's say, 20, 30. It's a big difference. So what are you learning when you have access to understanding all of these different galaxies? Well, how, how they evolve. I mean, how they, they uh, their stellar population varies from galaxy to galaxy and how they evolve. You know, I don't know. Astronomy is kind of a funny thing because it's all hypothetical and, and uh, proving something is kind of hard sometimes. <laughs> but anyway. What is yeah. gravitational settling? Uh, you take, take a bunch of pills and you take a bottle of water and you put the pills in the water and they sink to the bottom. Gravitational settling. <laughs> How does that apply in astronomy? Uh, well, the, for example, the stellar atmosphere is um, is like the water, and if you have uh, features in it, that they're going to sink, and you can pick out the features. It's it's all astronomy is. It's all very wishy-washy because you're not, you can't touch anything. So it's all this indirect observations and trying to get a bigger data set 
but not by looking at what's near X and Y, but by finding more objects you can reach. I don't know. <clears throat> In the 90s, when LIGO was getting started, were you following that? Oh, yeah, that was great. <laughs> That was really amazing. You realized how exciting it would be right from the beginning? Well, it's a whole new world, you know. You got, you got the optical, you got the infrared. It's very hard to do much in the UV because of the Earth's atmosphere absorbing everything. And then, and then you have all this high energy stuff and you have LIGO. It was a new world. Tell me, about, tell me about the Zero Z project. The high redshift universe work. Oh, that. Well, that was that was a clear thing to do because with <coughs> with the Fort with the Palomar telescope, you could just about do what we were trying to do for one galaxy, and suddenly you go to Keck and you can do it for twenty-five or thirty or forty. And so this was a tremendous jump forward of some of a known problem where you knew exactly what you wanted to know. And what you might expect to see, but you just couldn't do it. The, the jump between Palomar and Keck was a very big jump. It's not the, it's not the mirror size, it's the mirror size squared or cubed. You know? So it's a big factor. It makes a big difference. Did, did Keck essentially replace Chile for you in terms of where you would go? Uh, not all the time, because um, first of all, my husband would always like to go down to Chile and visit <laughs> his family. Uh, but, and, and I like Chile. I, I, uh, it's a beautiful country. And there's a lot of really interesting things there. And it's on the coast. And, um, so I didn't mind going to Chile. In fact, we went down uh, one time. They had this program go for three months or something. I think we were down there for three months. They gave us a, one of the houses. Stay there for three months. So, and also, um, the southern hemisphere has a more more points of great interest than does the northern hemisphere in many areas. So, yeah, I like going to China. To return uh, to return to glo glo globular clusters. What's the difference when we talk about the inner halo and the outer halo of globular clusters? Well, uh, I, are you talking about the clusters or about the, the parent galaxy? The clusters. Well, I've not heard the term used that way. I mean, the inner halo in the vocabulary that I've heard is is for the galaxy. And the outer halo is for further out in the galaxy. And and it applies to clusters uh, as, as units and, and not... Within each other cluster, there's inner and outer. I, I think you're a little confused there. Judy, when did you first start to think about exoplanets, not in a theoretical sense, but you could actually see them? Um, I would say that I thought there was promise there, but when Dimitri Maui joined the faculty, that when he came to give a talk so that we, we could decide to appoint him to the faculty, he blew me away. That man is brilliant. And he's working in a field which is uh, very competitive, but the combination of brilliance and knowing what to do and having heck has pushed him to the absolute forefront of this very compelling field. You should talk to him if you haven't. Talked. Absolutely. Now, it would seem, again, just purely theoretical. Shouldn't it not be surprising at all that there are exoplanets? If our sun is a regular star, shouldn't there be planets all over the universe? Because we know there are stars all over the universe. Yes, yes, but it's always nice to see them, <laughs> to be able to detect them in one way or another. Um, it's not like... like uh, the Christians are lined up against the wall saying, hail all earth or whatever, but <laughs> certainly there was some element of that. <laughs> Is the excitement about exoplanets mostly about the possibility of discovering other life forms, 
Or is there something more intrinsic about exoplanets that's of interest? Oh, I think the excitement of possible life forms is fascinating. Like most people believe that's just fabulous. <laughs> and and what was the telescope or what was the first project that confirmed the existence of exoplanets? Well, I don't know if it was Dimitri or somebody else because um, it may have been some other Europeans uh, the European telescope, the big European telescope was more uh, set up for that than we were at that time. Of course, now Dimitri's fixed 50 million things and, and it's, uh, it's much better, but at that time the instrumentation was not very good. And as the field was developing exoplanet research in the early years, what were your contributions in terms of looking for stars that might be host to exoplanets? Oh, you don't need my help to do that. I mean, um, the the obvious game is to their their initial efforts were so difficult that they would just take the brightest thing around and and not not even try to do it. The, maybe they try the first brightest three things, but that would be it. It was a, it's a hard slog. That that was a brilliant appointment. We got lucky. Judy, did you take on graduate students right away at Caltech? I have had very few graduate students. I don't know if that's because I'm a woman or because I'm working in a field which is not as sexy as exoplanets or something like that. Um, but I've had very few graduate students. What about in terms of women coming to Caltech as graduate students? Have there not been that many? Has that been part of the problem also? Uh, well, surely that's been part of the problem. That um, it's gotten better with time, but not it's too late for me. <laughs> Besides time, did you ever get out in front of those issues about calls to diversify the program, bring in more women and minorities? Uh, well, um, I I know a lot about the efforts that they were making at that time, which you cannot. Um, I'm, I, you can always say do more, but they did try a lot. For example, at one point, every professor that went on travel, they would ask you to go and visit prospective women students in their homes and talk to their parents. And I did that a couple of times. I would go visit people who were at there's one, the Puna House School, I think it's called. There's one real, Hawaii has terrible schools, but there are one or two good ones. And and I would be directed to stop off at the home of, of a woman student who was at that school and try to persuade them to apply to Caltech. They, they have tried very hard. I'm, I'm sure they could try harder, but I don't blame them for the women's situation. It's, it's the... It's a disgrace of our time, not not per particular to Caltech. What about among undergraduates? Have you seen more women undergraduates coming into astronomy over the years? I think um, there are more. I had a brilliant surf student last. My last surf student was absolutely brilliant, and she's now applying to grad school. And my letters of reference say basically. She's the best there is, take her. I'm sure this woman is going to be a huge success. Um, I really don't see much discrimination of that kind anymore. It was bad before, but uh, I think it's okay now. Or close to okay. I think the real, the real problems start when you start talking about having children and stuff like that. Then it gets, it was horrible before, and now it's, medium. <laughs> but if you look at the younger faculty, I'm too old for this, but the younger women faculty do have families and they have managed, many of them, not all of them, many of them, and they have managed to have children and have them, you know, be decent human beings and all that. But in my generation, it was harder. Judy, more recently, tell me about the work from the Pan-STARRS survey 
which looked at dark matter distribution in the Milky Way? Um, I am not uh, overly familiar with that survey, so I will keep my mouth shut. <laughs> but uh, the, Pan the Panstar survey, let's try this retrieval. The Panstar survey was the first really good accurate photometry over the whole sky, uniform, and, and producing a database. You know, just the fact that it had this big database and you could look up position A and position B, and what was there, that was a really big thing in, in, in that time. Big data was, was, was t tiny then. And, uh, and today, of course, big data is enormous. <laughs> But that was an immense success. It was the first all sky, no, all sky, but all north, all, I guess it was all southern sky. Uh, it was the first all sky survey like that. That was how to, how to format that you could use. You know, it wasn't just some pile of papers, it was something you could really use. That was the great thing about the hand stars. Judy, tell me about being elected to the National Academy in 2017. What was that like? I didn't know I was going to be elected. I didn't know anything about it until it was over. <laughs> I, I, Caltech handles those things sort of in that way. Right now, I'm, uh, I spent a large chunk of my time this spring um, writing two things. One was a biography of Jerry Nelson, who was the father of Keck, and who died several years ago. And I was asked to write a memorial for him for the National Academy, which I did. It took a lot of time, but it was good. And then I called up Fiona, and I said, I want to nominate X. You'll probably guess who X is later, but I'm not going to tell you. I'll tell you if you're right or wrong, but I'm not going to tell you the name. Um, I want to nominate X for the Shaw Prize which is it, basically one below the Nobel Prize. And she said, okay. Well, she, I asked her last year, she said, I, I, I can only nominate one person and um, somebody's beat you to it, basically. And, and it wasn't an astronomer. Who, who, whoever it was, A, it wasn't an astronomer, and B, they didn't win the prize because nobody knows nothing about it. <laughs> but I'm trying to get that prize for sure. And I've spent a fair amount of time this year writing a you know, beautiful encomium. <laughs> Hopefully this will work. <laughs> Won't know for another few months, but that would be great. That's the kind of thing I do now. Judy, a question about committee work. Given that you were on the steering committee for Keck for, for, for so long, what, what has been useful with regard to your committee work for TMT? Knowing all that you do about Keck. Well, for, uh, knowing all that I know about Keck, I think the TNT project is is ridiculous at this point in time. That the way it's being run is ridiculous. That they're spending a fortune and not getting any place, and that they should shut down until they can straighten out the the um, the sightseeing situation. But it's not just that. It's that. Astronomy has become so big now that that the way we ran Keck won't work. It's too big for that. The TMT is, is such a huge project that it's got to be highly bureaucratic and lots of committees and all this kind of stuff. And, and with Keck, we could avoid it to some big, major extent. And this is just insane. How much of that is about the fact that Keck was a private benefactor, whereas TMT is multiple countries and the NSF? That's, that's a big effect because basically uh, we never... Um, for Keck, there was a bunch that laid down from ground zero, and we tried to adhere to it as best possible. And maybe we missed like 5 or 10%. But we didn't miss by a huge factor. And and the end was horrible because we did miss by five or ten percent, maybe more. But if you miss by five or ten percent for the TMT, that's a shitload of money. You know. 
and, and so you have and and the engineering is so much more complicated and and so you have these platoons of people and these platoons of idiots if I should say that who have no experience of big telescopes who are on these committees and, and don't understand how it has to run I I, I think that the uh, TMT project is, is never going to get the personal what do you think the implications are for the master lease in Hawaii? Well, I don't know. I think I think that that the present administration um, and the present Keck management fully understand the difficulties of uh, the major problems that the Hawaiians have, and whether they can. Um, surround them or not, I don't know. I don't really know because the the um, the, what's the, word? the employment situation in Hawaii is terrible. It's either hospitality or or observatories, basically. And it's going to be very difficult to change that because who wants to build any kind of factory? in the middle of the Pacific, and then you have to ship everything over the place. You know. So I don't see their economic... And I think they understand it. That certainly the governor and the people at that level understand that statement very clearly. The problem is, is how to deal with the pride of these people and not antagonize them so much. And, you know, there's a lot of hurt pain in in, in the background, I don't know. Judy, serving as uh, Caltech's member rep to Aura, was that more of a service thing, or that was important for your research? No, that was a service thing, strictly a service. Thing. Um, what did that entail? <clears throat> well, they had um, two meetings a year, and they were each two or three days, and they were held in, in a nice hotel up in the mountains, the front of the mountains in, in, um, in Tucson. Um, and, and it was sort of kind of the little guys, it was, or is very peculiar because there's so many members and every member counts equally. And so you can get into these weird situations where people who don't know what the hell's going on are making decisions. And, um, you know, that, that was my problem to ignore. You can't say that to them, of course, because they're, they're responsible to the federal government. And, and you can't say to a bunch of universities, shut up, you don't know what you're talking about. So it was kind of interesting. I mean, I hope I pushed them around in the right directions, but... And what's the status of magic at Keck, the next generation guider? Well, uh, how much do you know about recent developments of Keck dollars? I've been following. Okay. Basically, nothing has happened at Keck of substance except what Dimitri's doing over the past few years. And it's been a, a, a partially lost uh, initiative of money and partially an issue of nobody's really stepping forward and saying, I want this and I'm willing to give up my time to make it happen. You know, people haven't been stepping up. Um, now, hopefully, uh, that will change some. We'll see. But. Some interesting nomenclature at the Subaru Telescope the Galactic Archaeology Project. What does that mean, Galactic Archaeology? Well, that's a, what they mean is that the, the evolution of the stars as a system, not individual stars. Well, they, they measure individual stars, but they're hoping to measure properties of huge numbers of stars in each individual galaxy. And the... the um, the ticket is, let's see, Milky Way, the outer part of the Milky Way, 
uh, an M31 and maybe one galaxy further out, but that's it. That's all they could do at the at the level of detail that they want for galactic archaeology. After that, you move over to the galaxy group, where the level of detail is much lower, and therefore you can go to much fainter and more distant objects. Now, my problem with the Subaru miss is that I find it um, the Japanese lack experience, to put it bluntly, and their hierarchical structure makes it hard to criticize things. And they, um, I'm very worried about that project. Let's put it that way. It's a, it's a, it sounds not so hard, but it's very hard. And the people who are running the show are the Japanese. And the Japanese are not up to it. And that's one of the reasons that I got out of it. I, I may be still involved, but I don't do any work on it. I listen. I go to the meetings of the steering committee and offer comments, but I am not actively working on that project. Do you see any similar issues in dealing with the Japanese for TMT and their very unique approach to TMT issues? I think they'll, it, it won't be as bad because the Japanese dominate the, the PFS project. It's their project, whereas the, TN, the TNT project is, uh, there's a lot of partners in there, and most of them, not all of them, but most of them are pretty reasonable. Um, you know. Judy, to bring our conversation right up to the present, are our computational capacities up to the task of all of the data that's coming in from both space-based and ground-based telescopes? Well, that's it. Certainly, if you just... Uh, I, I really don't know. I think we have to... Um, one of the big thrusts over the past two or three years that Keck has been archiving, making an archive that's useful. Not that we haven't had an archive, it's that we haven't had one which is easily searchable and you, know, you can find what you want and see what's there in a reasonable length of time without killing yourself. Um, but clearly this this trend, you can go two ways. You can go fainter, and, and if you try to go fainter, you don't have this problem because you're spending more time on each object. Or you can try to do um, more detailed studies of closer things, and then you're going to have a problem with too much data. And I don't see it yet as too much data, but it could get there. It could get there. Are you excited about the James Webb Telescope, which hopefully will launch next week? Um, I don't know which way to pray now. <laughs> I mean, I, I really don't know. I hope it works. I mean, it'll be tremendous embarrassment for a lot of people if it doesn't do. And there's so many things that can go. You know, it's been, and and it's been taken to put put together and taken apart so many times that you're really worried. <laughs> I I would I don't have the stamina for that project. I have to be much younger, much more, much less, uh, much more hopeful. Maybe <laughs> if it all goes well, what are you most curious about? What can the Webb Telescope tell us that we don't know yet? Uh, well, I really haven't thought carefully about what to do if I was given the night of uh, the equivalent of the night on web, um, because a lot of my work is fairly high dispersion. And uh, which means what? What does that mean? High dispersion. It means that if you take, if you look at the focal plane, and you divide it up into chunks, and uh, and look at the wavelength range in each chunk. If it's high dispersion, there's a lot of detail on a smaller range in, in uh, wavelength. And if you go low dispersion, you'll get more, in, more information, but uh, fewer objects or, not, or something like that. And um, space astronomy in particular, since 
it's so limited in terms of the size of the telescope, you know, just, just can't launch anything much bigger than, than James Webb. Um, and the cost is so high. You really have to be careful about what science you do. And, and uh, I guess I never got into that game. Well, Judy, for the last part of our talk, now that we've worked all the way up to the present, we've even peeked into next week. Some big retrospective questions for you, thinking about your earliest days at Harvard and your initial interest in astronomy. So at the broadest possible level, because of your research, what do we now know about galaxies in the universe that we didn't know before? <laughs> well, I guess, I guess the most <clears throat> interesting thing <clears throat> that has come out <clears throat> of galaxies for the longest time is this whole issue of quote dark matter and uh, what that might be. That's a different world. Though. I think what we've really <clears throat> been able to do is to show that we can reproduce with our current uh, set of physical parameters and physical understanding practically everything you see in, in, this, in galaxies that you can examine in detail. There hasn't been a, a, a shot, you know, like here's this guy standing with his hand raising saying, hey, look at me, I'm a different, uh, you can't explain me. I don't think, I don't, I think looking back, everything has sort of fallen into place pretty nicely. <clears throat> and I don't think there have been any great shockers. I mean, the whole, the whole exoplanet business was just impossible in the past. It was technically impossible. But it wasn't that people didn't believe that there might be other planets. It was impossible. And I think a lot of things in astronomy were like that. It was just too hard to do. And now all this stuff isn't too hard to do. And I wonder sometimes if we build a TMT, what we'll learn that will be worth the price. Because it'll be just more microscopy on slightly more distant uh, objects, but but what will be the totally new thing that'll blow you away? I'm curious. It could be techno signatures or biosignatures on an exoplanet. Sure, that would blow us away. But but um, but that's something we could foresee. You know, you 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 named it, right? Right. That's it. But I don't see anything else in that kind of category. The unknown unknowns. Yeah, yeah. And those are the most interesting ones. Right? Judy, mm -hmm. to flip the question around, not the discovery part, but the, the ongoing puzzles or mysteries. What are some of the things where there really hasn't been that much progress relative to 40, 50 years ago? Well, I think that the technical revolution of the last 40 or 50 years has been so great <clears throat> that there aren't many places like that, uh, aren't many niches like that at all. I, I can't think of anything unless you start talking about maybe the far UV, where we just can't get it from the ground. And, uh, but uh, I, I don't see it. <clears throat> and yet with all of these technological advances, we still don't understand how to unify gravity with the other forces. We still don't know what dark energy is. We still don't know what dark matter is. Is that to say that these kinds of breakthroughs will need to happen in the theoretical realm? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, it, if that's where it happens. Because I think we're not going to see it in the observational realm. We, we see too clearly right now. Is that to say then that with the theoretical breakthrough, our observational capacity, our technological capacity is ready to jump in. Jump in and demonstrate test yeah. the theory. That, that's uh, that's my view unless this unless this uh, theoretical breakthrough is so far away. Um, I mean we've we've looked at zillions of galaxies that are close. More zillions of galaxies that are only slightly more different in great detail. And there's the laws of physics all seem to work, and everybody's reasonably content that they understand things more or less. I'm not saying all the details are perfect. 
But to, to have a totally new breakthrough, I just don't know. And I sometimes wonder about the TNT in that regard. Um, but we'll see. In, in looking at all of these other galaxies, do you come away with more an appreciation that the Milky Way is unique or not? No, it's not unique at all. <laughs> it's not unique at all. The question of whether it's unique because it has life is something we can't answer. But in terms of the normal properties you can look at and measure and stuff like that, it's not unique. At and all. why can't we answer that question about light? About life? Yeah. We can, because we do not know what physical scale we should be looking at. And if it's a very large physical scale, we may not have it. And if it's too small, we just don't know what where to look, basically. Judy, finally, last question to the future. What are you most interested in for as long as you want to remain active, for as long as you want to follow the field? What are the things that will continue to excite you in the years ahead? Um, well, I'm real curious to see what JWST is going to do. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I watch the budgets of those things occasionally, especially when I was on the ORA committees. And, and you wonder at the comparison of the, of the on the ground versus the satellite game is. <laughs> and how much better it would be if that, that number were a little different. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing. With your appreciation of the vastness of the universe, does that ever lead you into philosophical questions or even spiritual questions, or you keep those worlds separate? No, I keep those worlds separate, yeah. Judy, I want to thank you so much for doing this. I'm so <laughs> appreciative. Are you going to do